Hello, and welcome back to a continuing discussion of Bergson's theory, Bergson's philosophy of mind, with emphasis on his holographic aspects. This is part three. We'll be discussing the classic metaphysic versus Bergson's temporal metaphysic, how time or motion must be treated as indivisible or non-differentiable, the origin of the scales of time on our perceived world, and ultimately the relationship of subject and object. Last time in parts one and two, I described how for Bergson, the universal field is holographic. That is, the field of matter is a vast interference pattern. And as such, it is non imageable. It looks nothing like the external world that we know. For Bergson, the brain is a modulated reconstructive wave passing through this holographic field. This brain supported wave is specific to a source in the holographic field and by this process now an image, the coffee cup on our kitchen table. There's no image of the coffee cup in the brain. Again, the brain slash wave is simply specific to a source in the holographic field. But there's no viewer, no homunculus, little man inside the brain looking at the external image. So this section, section three, part three, we will definitely be discussing how Bergson removes, removes the viewer which is the whole problem of the relationship of subject and object. Again, we noted that we are seeing a past transformation, a past transformation of a small portion of the external holographic field. As I'm watching my fly, the fly's wing beats have long come and gone before I'm actually perceiving the fly. And the question is, how is this past specification possible? Now we go directly, because of this, into Bergson's model of time. We need this to solve the question. Underlying current physics is what I like to term the classic metaphysic of space and time. Relativity, which is physics' premier theory of time in, in reality, and why physics holds sway as a theory of time, is simply the logical epitome of this metaphysic. The metaphysic is a general conceptual structure on space, time, and motion. It's an epistemological knowledge framework. And it is a projection frame, as it were, for our theories of the, of the real, of reality, both in physics and psychology. It is an abstract space that is imposed that is an imposed and arbitrary static conceptual backdrop. <clears throat> it is ubiquitous, <clears throat> ingrained, and extremely useful. It underlies our mathematical treatment of the transforming universe of matter. It is the support of calculus itself. It lies beneath artificial intelligence and our concept that the brain is a form of computer. <clears throat> its usefulness is so enthralling, it is taken as an ontological reality. That is, it's taken as the actual structure and dynamics of the ever transforming field of matter. For Bergson, this conceptual structure was obscuring our deeper penetration into the physical world. It is precisely the job of theory, Bergson argued, to break through this imposed framework. For Bergson, a theory of matter is an attempt to find the reality hidden beneath customary images which are entirely relative to our needs. This quote is from Matter and Memory, 1896, and we'll be seeing a lot of quotes from that in this part for that chapter. Chapter four is a profound discussion on the problem of space and time. So a theory of matter is an attempt to find the reality hidden beneath customary images, which are entirely relative to our bodily needs. 
And this is the origin of the classic metaphysic. So again, emphasizing the dependence of our conceptual structures on bodily action, he would note, but the materiality of the atom dissolves more and more under the eyes of the physicist. We have no reason, for instance, for representing, representing the atom to ourselves as a solid rather than as a liquid or gaseous, nor for picturing the reciprocal action of atoms by shocks rather than by any other way. Why do you think of a solid atom and why of shocks? Because solids, being the bodies in which we clearly have the most hold, are those which interest, interest us most in our relations with the external world. So as I noted, this metaphysic is an abstract space. And in, in, in Bergson's terms, it's a principle of infinite divisibility. And it's a space that indeed rises from our basic bodily needs, as the previous quote indicates. So the origins, we're faced with, when we're, when we're born as infants, a vast, undifferentiated field of experience. We haven't picked out chairs, we haven't picked out bottles, we haven't picked out mothers and fathers, for that matter, and, and identify them as separate objects. That's the, that is the task, initial task of perception. So perception identifies objects in development, over its course of development, objects on which our body can act. A spoon, a piece of cheese, a bottle of beer. The world then is eventually partitioned into objects and motions. Bottles of beer moving, cheese moving, spoons moving to the to their mouth and back again. Now the notion of objects is rarefied, or objects are rarefied to the continuum of spatial points or positions. Every object in the continuum is infinitely divisible. We can take a block of cheese and divide and divide and divide until we end up with a set of points or tiny crumbs. And likewise then, just as the objects are divisible, the continuum on which the objects rest is conceived to be infinitely divisible, a continuum of points. As Bergson put it, abstract space is, as it were, a mental diagram or mesh placed over extensity, whose squares, shall we say, in the mesh, we can mentally contract further and further, each square becoming smaller and smaller until we arrive at each square being a little point or the continuum of points or positions. So when we come to motion, when an object, say our buzzing fly, moves from point A to point B over this continuum, it is conceived to trace a trajectory or a line in space. It's a space. But the line consists, of, again, of a set of points in the continuum. It's simply a set of points linear, linearly taken across a chunk of the continuum. Each moment passed over by the object is conceived to correspond to an instant of time. Thus, time in this framework, in this classic metaphysic, is treated as just another dimension, in this case, the fourth, of this abstract space. But when motion is treated merely as a set of points, and as the line, that is a space, is infinitely divisible, then to explain the motion between each pair of static immobile points, we must insert a new line with its points, which I'm doing there with my little fly. So if I look at the initial tra trajectory from A, a to B, and it's a set of points, then to explain the motion between two of those points there, well, I simply uh, break the line down into more points. But now I've got to break, explain the line, uh, the motion between two points on the second line there, so I break it down to even uh, smaller, you know, tiny, tinier distances and, and uh, 
uh, smaller points, I guess, but this goes on forever. It's, in other words, this is a process we must do over and over again, ad infinitum, that is, it's an infinite regress. So when we treat motion by as points, as a merely, merely a set of points, we, we inherently hit this regress on actually explaining motion. This treatment, Bergson argued, is the root cause of Zeno's paradoxes. Achilles, running after the hare in Zeno's paradox, continually halves the distance to the tortoise as he runs along this infinitely divisible line or space or trajectory. It is an infinite operation, halving. So he never catches the tortoise. The halves just get smaller and smaller, but he never ever gets there. Again, in the flying arrow paradox for Zeno, the arrow never moves, for at any instant it is at rest at a static point in this space. It's at the first static point here, then it's simply found at the next static point, then it's at the next static point. Again, one is left with having to explain how the motion occurs between the two points, and one can end up with having to virtually hypothesize that the entire universe to include the arrow is regenerated or reborn each instant, as we shall see. So I should note that we should view, I think, Zeno in this context, in his contemporary context, as simply trying to use these paradoxes to, to bash the heads of his contemporaries with the consequences of the classic metaphysic. Now, there are popular misconceptions with regard to Zeno and his paradoxes. One is that Bertrand Russell solved these. He did not. In fact, though there are four paradoxes, he accepted the fourth, though it has the same root problem, namely motion is being treated as a space, as the other three, and he changed his position on this subject a few times. Another misconception is that there are calculus or math solutions. There are not, though we'll be looking at one of these a little bit later on just to see where it goes wrong. But again, the calculus math solutions inherently must treat motion as a space. Save for Bergson's analysis, the problem remains. For Bergson, motion, or thus the transformation of the universal field, namely time, must be treated as indivisible. Achilles moves in indivisible steps. He most certainly catches the hare. So Bergson is rejecting the notion that we can treat motion as a space, as a line, as an infinitely divisible space. It's in, we must treat motion as indivisible. Motion, Bergson argued, should be conceived as a melody where each note, it is instant, inter interpenetrates the next, each note reflecting the entire preceding series of notes forming an organic whole. From this perspective, the motion of time itself, the, the transformation, the time transformation of, of the universal field itself carries an elementary form of memory. In the classic metaphysic, where time consists of a series of discrete instants, where the instants are simply partitions of a spatial line, each instant falls into the past when the next instant, that is the present instant, arrives. So as my little fly flies along this trajectory here, and we've stopped them at the, at the present instant, we see that the past instant is now considered to be non-existent. The past is actually our symbol of non-existence. So, so according to the classic metaphysic, the 
most previous instant has always fallen away into the past. We have only the present. And by the very definition of the classic metaphysics, classic metaphysic matter, matter itself only exists for the present instant. As the universe transforms over time, the universal field, the entire past motion has all fallen away into non-existence. The brain, of course, is matter. Only existing for the duration of an instant, the brain is assigned the task of somehow instantly storing each present instant to preserve it before that instant of, and, and of, falls away into the past. So it has to preserve, the brain has to preserve the past, the, the, that present instant of the fly's motion before it drops off into the past. You, you can get a sense here of the logical conundrum that's actually beneath this model, but this is the model. The, the answer here is no, this transformation is actually indivisible. There are no instants that fall into the past. It's this indivisible motion that is the glue of the instance, or another way to put it is the organic continuity that under the melody model of Bergson, where each note is the reflection of the whole and forms a, and, and the whole forms an organic con, uh, continuity. So the brain as a reconstructive wave, therefore, is able to optimally specify Again, optimal specification, a pass motion of the holographic field, stirring spoons, buzzing flies, falling, twisting leaves, wobbly knot cubes, all transforming in an indivisible flow. The brain is not relying on mythical, logically impossible, short-term storage areas of static memory yet to be found integration areas and integration methods yet to be found to store these flows. Now this relates to another short-term memory solution, quote unquote, for registering motion, the problem we talked about extensively in part two, namely the, the, the idea of the continuity of neural processes. I quote here from John Taylor, the, as a, an example of this, this concept, quote, the features of an object bound by various mechanisms to activity and working memory, thereby, thereby provide the content of consciousness of the associated object. In these neural activity loops, neural activity relaxes to a temporarily, temporarily stable state therefore providing the extended temporal duration of activity necessary for consciousness. So this continuity of neural processes is what he thinks supports the rotating cube or the fly buzzing by or the falling twisting leaf. But this is simply a logical inconsistency, a violation of the logic of the classic metaphysic which dictates why storage must be in the brain in the first place, that is, to preserve the just past instant. He, Taylor can assign no continuity of neural processing, no temporal extension of neural processing uh, in the classic metaphysic in which he inherently and intrinsically works. He's ultimately and implicitly appealing to an entirely different metaphysic of the flow of time but without explicitly acknowledging it. And this again is rather endemic to the whole discussion. Complete confusion or, or failure to recognize that there are two different metaphysics and uh, one the classic and one the temporal and acknowledging which one they're in, they tend to slip back and forth. So logically, as I said, in the metaphysic, even neural processes can only have the time extent of an instant. In actuality, that of a mathematical point. For a mathematical point is the logical end of the infinite division of a trajectory. 
Such a point has neither start nor end because there is nothing to divide. It is static. It has no extent in time. But this is the logical time extent of neural processes within the classic metaphysic. It's the logical time extent of any motion. It's the logical time extent of the motion of the fly when, when uh, taken to this ultimate logical end, a mathematical point. Again, the classic model of time demands storage of events in the brain. That is storage and matter, because matter equals the present. Again, as we as Mr. Fly buzzes by, we've got to store that present instant before it's gone into the non-existence of the past. It's the whole logic behind storage in the brain in the first place. So the logical implications of this metaphysic, which underlies this whole attempt to figure out how the brain is storing experience, are unexamined and never made explicit. Now, when we look at physics, we see the notion of the indivisibility of, of motion uh, or time is knocking at physics door. De Broglie noted that Heisenberg's uncertainty is in, in effect the projection of a motion to a static point in our point continuum. But when we project the motion to a static point, we have lost the motion. Feynman and Feynman and Hibbs argued that the motion of a particle is continuous, but not differentiable. And Natali in 1996, bouncing off Feynman and Hibbs, argued very bluntly that space-time is not differentiable. Differentiation implies infinite divisibility. As we divide the slope of a triangle, or a motion from point A to point B into successively smaller slices, ultimately taking a limit to arbitrarily end what is in fact an infinite operation. That is an, an infinite division into smaller and smaller slices. In the fractal context of Natale, with the awesome implications of the nature of fractals, because Natale is work, was working with a, a fractal model, Everywhere one looks at the geodesic curves of space-time, so the, most, the curves, the curves that objects trace, shall we say, through the space-time manifold, ultimately, at the most infinitesimal of scales, one finds an inflection point, meaning the curves cannot be differentiated. which is to say that there is no velocity derivable at an instant, at a static point. Linz, Foundation of Physics Letters, 2003, echoing Bergson, implicitly also reinforcing Natale from a different direction, argued that there can be no static instant underlying any dynamic physical process. There is constant change no matter how infinitely small the interval examined, there is change. If there were such a truly static instant, as I noted already before, the entire universe would be frozen, never to change again. No value then can be fixed with certainty. Every equation of physics is subject to uncertainty. Linz argued it is an, an, an intrinsic trade-off, precisely determined values for continuity through time. So in other words, the universe as a dynamically changing, transforming field is inherently subject to this uncertainty. There has to be change at the most minute interval of time. There can be no static point in this transformative flow of the universe. And if we hearken back to the optimal specification of cubes of non-rigid ellipses, that is the probabilistic, inherently probabilistic specification, 
we know that based on uncertainty involved with computation of velocities due to the aperture problem, we're now looking at what I warned was an even more foundational problem to the uncertainty. That is, this inherent uncertainty is a property of the transformation over time of the universal field itself. So for Linz, it is only the human observer, mentally immersed in the abstract space, who imposes a precise instant of time, a static instant, the static conceptual backdrop upon a physical process. Just to stay concrete, remember physical processes are buzzing flies, rotating cubes, falling leaves. No static instant can be imposed upon these processes. So if we return to Zeno, if the infinite division of a trajectory or motion could be completed, it would end, as I noted, as at a mathematical point, that is, at an indivisible extent. The point is no start point, no end point, nothing between which the arrow or fly can move. If the point did have an extent, it could be divided, start half, end half, and therefore not indivisible. So if time is made, of, of, made up of indivisible instants, instants in which by definition there is no motion of the arrow, how does the arrow move? Per Bergson, in the context of this model, he said, well, then movement is made up of immobilities. That is, it's an absurdity. A movement can't be made up of a set of immobilities. But this is the very condition of Lin's forever frozen universe. At a static instant, that is at, at an indivisible mathematical point in time, of time, as an extent of time that's an indivisible mathematical point, the universe is frozen. It cannot move. It's, there's no, there, this, this is the frozen universe. All change is impossible. The entirety of space would have to be reborn, regenerated instant after instant. Now up there in my little picture, I have an instant of 3D space. Okay, now to get to the next instant, that block, space two, has to be entirely regenerated and reborn. And be because there's no motion in space one, and there's no motion in space two. So how do you ever get to space three without regenerating the entirety of 3D space, that is the universe? So this is yet another infinite regress. The hidden process behind the regeneration of the entirety of space is now the issue. It would have to be continuous. So there is no interval, no matter how small, in which the universe is not constantly changing. The arrow's position is constantly changing. It never occupies one block of space. Now, I warned that I'd look at one math solution. In this particular approach, the distance is traversed and time taken are treated as an infinite geometric series. Each successive term is multiplied by one half, each term thus becoming smaller. Such a series converges, taking a limit as it approaches infinity. We arrive at a finite answer for the time for Achilles to uh, overtake the tortoise. This technique simply ignores that infinity is infinity. That is, we have arbitrarily ended the infinite operation by a mathematical convention. And this next point I'm taking from another article by Linz on Zeno's paradox, this point and actually a piece of the subsequent critique, very related in the spirit of Bergson, <clears throat> for this technique is also leaving untouched the problem of Achilles' motion within the static intervals, or addressing any actual physical resolution of the infinities, or a model thereof, that is, of this physical resolution. In each of the intervals, it is assumed that the velocity of Achilles is fixed, determined. 
but the values for each interval are not actually representing the time he was at a position, but rather that he was passing through this interval. These velocity values were v is equal to distance divided by time for each interval are again reliant on the static conceptual backdrop. The reality is that he is always passing through this backdrop no matter how small the interval into which he has no actual physical relation. So I make one more comment on what was said here in this argument. Take the phrase, no actual physical resolution of the infinities. To get a meaning for that, we could imagine that the halving algorithm could be implemented by a robot. That is, the robot would follow the algorithm of taking one half the distance and half the distance, etc., to the turtle. Now, under that algorithm, it would never reach the turtle. But if it computed the mathematical series convergence, what would this then mean physically for the robot? He's computed a mathematical convergence, but what does it mean? Just one more big step out of the, out of the blue to pass the turtle? Truthfully, the mathematical resolution is meaningless physically. The other statement made, he is always passing through this backdrop, that is Achilles, no matter how small the interval, and to which he has no actual physical relation. Again, another way to put this is that Achilles is moving in reality in an indivisible motion. He is never fixed at one static interval as the series demands. Now, there's much more that one could pull out of this particular argument, but I think this is enough for now. So Bergson argued there, there has to be real motion. Any and all motion cannot be, become rest, that is static, as per the classic metaphysic, simply upon perspective. That is, all motion cannot be relative. In the classic metaphysic, the object can move over the continuum or the coordinate system, or the continuum or coordinate system can move be beneath the object. Motion, in other words, becomes rest merely upon change of perspective. So Bergson noted, we may not be able to say which objects are in motion, which objects are at rest, but real motion there must be. Now he said this in 1896, well before Einstein's relativity of 1905, though Galilean relativity clearly existed and physics was well aware of this, but this preceded the 1905 relativity. But real motion there must be. Using my own examples of what he meant by this, stars explode, trees grow, mountain ranges arise. In other words, there are real changes of configuration in configuration in real systems. One does not make these kinds of real changes, real motion in the universe go away simply by changing perspective on whether one is at rest or at motion. The organic growth of a tree, for example, simply cannot be relativized. It's a simultaneous causal flow where I am an observer stationary watching this tree grow in very fast time and two branches shot out from one to the right, one to the left, and both hit a point spread apart, two points spread apart, equidistance from where they, where they started and hit those points simultaneously. Yes, an observer could come by in motion and say, because he was in motion, he saw the light from the leftmost branch hit him first and then later on the rightmost branch and thus it wasn't simultaneous, a simultaneous uh, event of 
these two branches hitting a point equidistant. But that observation really doesn't amount to a hill of beans relative to the reality of this real organic growth, this simultaneous causal flow that is to this real motion. So Bergson noted, we must view the whole as changing, he argued, as though a kaleidoscope. In this type of motion, the motions of separate objects become changes or transferences of state when this global, within this global transformation or motion. That is, the objects become, as it were, waves in the sea not separable from the sea, but phases of the motion of the sea. This is a transformation with an inherent simultaneity, and it is indivisible, like a melody. So let's apply this now to our perception of events. Events being ongoing transformations within and of the universal field. We know that the fly is specified as a portion of the past indivisible or non-differentiable transformation of the matter field. The fly, his wings, a blur, to us a blur at 200 cycles per second, is also a reflection of the scale of time imposed by the field or imposed upon the field by the dynamics, physical and chemical, of the brain. We noted there is an infinity of possible scales of time. So here we go to an implication clearly seen already by Bergson in Matter Memory in Chapter 4, that the authors of the relativistic brain, a book I noted in Part 1, I believe, did not see. These authors had envisioned a constraint analogous to the speed of light, constraint in relativity, on the global processing velocity of the brain. But the value of this constraint can, in fact, be changed. The, normally, the brain is seen as having multiple levels. That is, the brain, in fact, however, is a coherent system. You change one level, you change the whole. So that is, we can conceive of the brain as at the lower level, lowest level being quarks, next level electron, next level chemical, next level molecular, as my little picture there shows, next level neural. It's rather a nested hierarchy of scales, but the point being, you change one level, you change the chemical level, you're changing the, the brain as a coherent system. If, what if we in, introduce a catalyst into this system? Now, a catalyst, by reorient, reorienting nuclear bonds, increases the velocity of chemical flows. That is, we're, we're starting to affect the chemical level of this system. It can raise the chemical velocities in the neural processes supporting this dynamic wave, our reconstructive wave that is the brain. So let's, let's consider in increasing the velocity of neural processes. If I, if I drop my catalyst into the brain and, and gradually in increase the neural processes, the, the velocity of the neural processes underlying perception, underlying the specification of the fly, as I increase those processes, the fly is going to move from a buzzing fly to the next level where I, I catch each individual wing beat. He's moving like a heron. He's flapping his wings slowly like a heron, increasing it yet more. I, I, I'm now catching the fly stock still. The wing's not moving at all, and I'm actually starting to dr drill down into sub-processes within the, within the fly that I'm now perceiving, perceiving as moving. I'm going to relate this more specifically to form and invariance. So let's suppose we have a cube slowly rotating, a cube being a four-sided figure. And we begin spinning the cube on this little axis there gradually more slow, uh, quickly and quickly. So the cube, looking from the top down, starts to transition through a series of figures with multiple serrated edges or points. We travel from a eight-pointed figure to a 12-pointed figure 
to a 16-pointed figure, ultimately to a spinning cylinder, a figure of infinite symmetry, for all these figures are figures of 4n-fold symmetry, 4, 8, 12, infinite. The cylinder has kind of fuzzed edges as those serrated points form a fuzzy field. Now take this in terms of a catalyst. Again, if we are considering increasing the catalyst to the power of the catalyst, thereby the velocity of processes, we're moving from, going from the right, a very rapidly rotating cube perceived as a fuzzy cylinder with fuzzy outline of but fuzzed edges to a tra gradual transformation, just reversing my arrows, from a figure of multifold symmetry to eightfold to ultimately fourfold symmetry, that is a cube in rotation. So gradually that rapidly spinning cylinder is being perceived as moving more and more slowly through figures of always four n-fold symmetry from a figure of infinite symmetry to figures of four n-fold symmetry to ultimately our cube slowly rotating a figure of fourfold symmetry. Of course, one could go the other way as you decrease the velocity of processes. Gradually, what would be a, a rotating cube would appear to be speeding up through these figures of four n fold symmetry to a figure of infinite symmetry. So, what we're pointing out here is that the, the dynamics of the brain where the dynamics includes the chemical velocity of processes is imposing a scale of time on the holographic field. Now, let's relate this to Bergson's perception is virtual action. Let's consider our little cat here, and he's watching a mouse going across his visual field from point A to point D. The first question we can ask is, well, how does the cat determine the velocity of the mouse? because the cat wants to intercept the mouse at point D. So he's got to time his leap to intercept the mouse at point D. Well, velocity is a function of time. And time requires some form of reference system. For example, I might be using my record here, rotating, where the where I de decide that the revolution of the record, one revolution, is equivalent to one second. That's what I specify. And since velocity is distance divided by time, I've got a method now to measure velocity. So, in this case, as my turtle travels, travels along, if a tra tur tur turtle travels six feet in one second, that is one rotation of the disk, his velocity is six feet per second. But now suppose I double the speed of the reference disk. So it's moving, it's circling twice as fast. Well, the turtle now would only cover three feet in one rotation or three feet in one second. His velocity is three feet per second. Just my simple exposition of why the reference system for time is all important. Well, what's the reference system for the body to compute velocities? I would argue that the most logical candidate is the velocity of processes, processes in the brain. That this velocity, just like the rotating record, ro rotating at a certain speed, forms the internal reference system. So again, let's consider introducing a catalyst. So let's introduce a catalyst into the body and brain of our friendly cat here. And therefore, as we increase the cat's internal velocity of processes supporting his perception, then analogous to the record and the turtle, where as we increase the record rotation, the specified velocity of the turtle was lowered from six feet 
per second to three feet per second. So the specified velocities of the external world for the cat begin to slow down. So what would be happening is that the mouse is moving more slowly, ever, ever more slowly. And my little graph there, which shows V min, the minimum velocity of the, of the cat required to intercept the mouse at D is gradually decreasing. So in other words, the mouse, mouse's lower velocity is precisely the reflection of the cat's greater time to act. He can leap, he can wait longer to leap to intercept the mouse at D from point C there. So if we take this in terms of our fly, where we have a state of the fly where he's barely moving his wings, even slower than heron flapping his wings, what we would have is a specification of how the organism, oh, as I put it there, can act, or how I can act. So perception, this is saying, has to be coordinate with action. In fact, action is the base of perception. The possibility of action is the base of how the world is specified. In this case, as a barely moving fly, reflective of how I could reach out slowly in my time scale that this fly is indicative of and grasp the fly by the wingtip at my leisure. So perception has to be coordinate with action for perception to be ecologically valid. If it were not, perception would be subject to very strange anomalies. The fly is specified as barely moving his wings. I reach out leisurely in my supposed time scale and the fly is long gone. Perception is not ecologically valid in that case. So this hypothesis that I could reach out as the fly specifies, being a reflection of the possibility of action, I've noted by that simple word, is testable. That is, down the road, one can conceive of testing this principle of virtual action. Now, if we can do this in principle, that is, raise what I will term the energy state, shorthand for the chemical velocity of processes, uh, if we can raise the energy state of the brain, then we must assume that nature has allowed for it. I didn't note that here, but we know that even an increase of temperature, a fever can, can, can have an effect on, on even on perception. So we must assume in principle, any, we can always run across some sort of, some sort of catalyst that changes things in, in the brain. We must assume that nature has allowed for it. This is why Gibson's invariance laws are required, are necessary for the specification of events of the external world. Effectively, by changing scales, then somewhat analogous to relativity, we are changing what relativity term, the space-time partition. In relativity, its essence was that only invariance laws hold across all partitions. So we have an observe, two observers, one at one system, or two systems in, with observers in the systems, one system at rest, one system in motion, and we have distance equal velocity times time, d equal vt, in the at rest observer's reference system, and we have d prime equal vt prime, uh, in other words, dis different units of distance and different units of time in another observer's reference system, in one in motion. So each observer has different units of space and time, that is, a different space-time partition, yet the law d equal vt, same form, d prime equal vt prime, holds in both systems. It is an invariant in both systems. This is the essence of 
relativity, this, the, in, the invariance law aspect of relativity that allows one to coordinate the measurements in these two systems. If we make this a little more concrete, like let's take Pittenger and Shaw's law for the aging transformation of the human head. Now, aging is a very slow transformation in our normal experience or normal scale of time. The head growth or change is specified by a strain transformation on a cardioid figure placed over the skull and placed upon a coordinate system. So in my little picture there, I have a cardioid figure, heart-shaped figure, and that's placed over a skull, and in turn, the skull is placed on the coordinate system. The strain transformation stretches the cardioid and the skull in the coordinate system itself in all directions as though it were on a rubber sheet. So as I do that stretching of the rubber sheet of the coordinate system, I'm in gradually increasing the strain value and the strain increases the aging. So I go from a child's face to a little older child to they're almost an adult. This is just three slices of the aging transformation that I've picked to show there are many more in between. But the point being that this is the law, a strain transformation on a cardioid that is specifying the aging of the facial profile. So let's suppose the head were transforming rapidly before us on a very fast scale, as though we were a being that watched humans grow up and die very quickly. Yet it is the strain law that is an invariance law that would be specifying how to modulate the hand to grasp the rap rapidly transforming head. It's a law that would be being incorporated into the action system for the specification of possible action. And this law would be an invariance law then, which is holding across space-time partitions. We saw another law like this already in terms of the rotating cube, which became increasingly serrated edged figures of always four n fold symmetry as the cube sped up and as we changed the space-time partition. So we had that four n fold symmetry invariance law that would have been information for action as well. Just two things I would note quickly with respect to virtual action as being the foundation of vision. Firstly, the motor areas send reentrant loops into the visual areas of the brain. That is to say, the motor areas are modulating vision, which is to say that the basis for the perception of the visual world is already in the action capabilities of the organism. Secondly, and counterintuitively, when the pathways were severed in, in monkeys, that is the pathways from the motor areas to the visual areas where motor areas are modulating the visual areas, the monkeys went blind. This is rather counterintuitive unless you're considering perception as indeed virtual action. So let me make one more comparison between this model of Bergson's and the artificial intelligence or computer model of mind. Now, in comparison to virtual action, the standard approach to perceiving the world and acting is coined in terms of the perception action cycle. In my little picture there, we see that we sense the external world, model it, plan it, then act upon it, change the world, see that the world changes, sense it, model, act. So it's the perception, perception action cycle. The notion of virtual action is not contained in this at all. In virtual action, via the dynamics of the brain, perception actually is the specification of possible action. And simultaneously, 
a specification of the scale of time being placed upon the holographic field. Further, given this very real concrete dynamics that's creating this specification and this time scaling and the specification, i.e. this the slowness or fastness of the moving mouse, the buzzing of the heron like of the fly or the heron like motion of the fly. Uh, this can all be changed simply by dropping a catalyst that changes the dynamics of the system. So all of this would be totally ad hoc for AI. It would have to be simulated, shall we say, but because there is no real dynamics, it is at best a running attempt to keep up to what the reality actually is. So now, we're moving from time scales to a more general question of the properties of the holographic field, ultimately leading to our subject and object question. So the properties of the holographic field. The field is a globally transforming whole. Within the motion of this whole, there are no objects undergoing motions. The motions of objects are changes or transferences of state. This motion is indivisible, non-differentiable. This non-differentiable motion of the matter field supports a primary memory. It's the glue of instants. In reality, there are no instants that instantly go into non-existent the past. This is the memory supporting rotating cubes, buzzing flies, singing violins. The question became, how does the brain specify this motion? Not, how does the brain store samples? Now note, spinning cubes, twisting leaves, gently waving curtains are qualia. They are motions of the whole of field, each with a certain quality. So let's relook at qualia for a moment from the perspective of the whole of field. The standard examples of qualia are basically static. The red of the sunset, the taste of a cauliflower, the aroma of the coffee. Things involving time and the dynamic are never considered as qualia, i.e. a twisting falling leaf, or Valerie Hardcastle's gently waving ever so slightly waving curtains or concentrating musicians. In other words, time and the dynamic are never considered as qualia. Now, the standard opinion is matter has no secondary qualities. In fact, you know, the, so the field of matter is utterly homogenous. There is no color, no sounds. Galileo began this at the inception of the classic metaphysic. Only the quantitative is part of matter. Everything else is contributed, contributed by, the by the living organism. That is, everything else is in the mind. And by the way, form has been thought to be in the quantitative. It's, and this, is, this I've, I've been showing is a mistake. Form is equally quality. But Galileo thereby stripped the matter field of all, of all quality. So this is all the effect in reality of the classic metaphysic. It's abstract space and it's abstract time. Or said again, the four dimensional continuum where, where time is simply a, another dimension of space of quality less mathematical points or positions. The hard problem, the origin of qualia and qualia, derives entirely from this metaphysic. It's a fiction of the classic metaphysic in its abstract space and time. If a motion is conceived as a trajectory of points, mathematical points, in the abstract continu continuum of points slash positions, each point slash instant disappearing as the next arrive, motions can have no quality. 
There are no qualities possible for gently, ever so waving curtains, ever so slightly waving curtains, a buzzing fly, a leaf twisting, etc. The abject, the abstract point continuum is homo homogeneous and qualityless, or homogeneous and qualityless. Hence, it is utterly mysterious to philosophers how qualities, that is qualia, whether of motions, a buzzing fly, gently waving curtains, or colors even, can arise from this abstract continuum. The classic metaphysic precludes it. And don't forget, the brain in the classic metaphysic is equally part of the abstract continuum. It is equally unable to contain qualia. All qualia in this metaphysic are forced into the non-physical, into the mental, into anywhere but the abstract continuum. So you'll find philosophers all saying, well, uh, qualia are all in the head, it's all mental. There are, because there's no qualia in the um, physical world. But the step by which these events go into another realm, i.e. the mental, within the confines of the metaphysic remains a dilemma. The metaphysical structure makes it impossible. And these outside realms, the, the mental, the phenomenal, are thus obscure, incapable of definition to science, because current science works precisely within the classic metaphysic. Because of this near vice-like grip of the classic metaphysic on the problem, qualia has become somewhat of a strange, rather distorted notion. It is everything apparently not accounted for by computation. So we get interesting conceptions like that of Hameroff and Penrose here, where, for example, qualia become almost atom-like, little atom-like things, where we have qualia, as it were, atoms in the geometry of space-time waiting to be correspondingly configured in microtubules, where microtubules are small, tiny structures in the neural structure of the brain. So it's as though the color of the coffee cup itself consists of a set of color qualia, which in turn, via some magical mapping, gets configured in the microtubules. That is, the little blue color qualia in the microtubules somehow form themselves into the coffee cup. What meaning this has is anyone's guess. The concern, of course, is that deep down is implied even in this particular model that we have something like the coffee cup in the brain then, an image in the brain with all of the difficulties that implies. Again, simply to refocus on form for a second, this is a qualitative transition. And this is a qualitative transition, two different qualities, the wobbly cube and the rotating rigid cube. So are you going to have form qualia for every possible form and every possible scale of time just waiting in microtubules to be configured? This is obviously absurd, but it's even worse. Remember Valerie Card's Castle's list, the patrons shifting in their seats, the musicians concentrating, the curtains ever so gently waving. These two is, are qualia. This, this is qualitative motion. What possible form qualia are you going to have residing in microtubules for these? But this is just some of the contortion that's being introduced by this, the classic metaphysic and its vice on the problem of quality and qualia. For Bergson, the holographic matter field and its non-differentiable, indivisible motion is qualitative or massively 
qualia. The entire field is qualia. The qualia of our experience actually our qualia permeated image of the external world is the brain specification of sources in this qualitative field and at a particular scale of time. Our buzzing fly was gradually spread out in time. We had, had buzzing wing beaks at 200, 200 cycles per second, a blur, flapping wings slowly like a heron, motionless, starting to see shimmering oscillations, ultimately an ensemble of swirling electrons. For Bergson, as he noted similarly in chapter four of Matter and Memory, just thinking about the color red, one second of red light is equal to 400 billion wave oscillations. Spread out this 400 billion waves we perceive as one second of red light and, and just at the rate it would take for us to discriminate each wave it would require 25,000 years to count each wave. So again, we have a massive range and scale of possible specification of one second of red light, what it might look like <laughs> equally for the fly. Thus, Bergson noted, may we not conceive, for instance, that the irreducibility of two perceived colors is due mainly to the narrow duration into which are contracted the billions of vibrations which they execute in one of our moments. If we could stretch out this duration, that is to say, live it at a slower rhythm, should we not, as the rhythm slowed down, see these colors pale and lengthen into successive impressions, still colored, no doubt, but nearer and nearer to coincidence with pure vibrations. In other words, as we move closer to the universal field taken at the null scale of time, that is the smallest, most minute, infinitely small scale of time, we come ever closer to the homogeneous medium or continuum of points of the classic metaphysic. The problem is this abstract continuum does not actually exist. The abstraction is the end, end point, the logical end point, but, is, but it in truth does not exist. We, we, we are dealing with a very concrete, mo in, always in motion field. The brain does not dwell in the universe of the classic metaphysic. That is the universe of abstract instance, the point continuum, motion from point to point. The brain could care less about this classic metaphysic and its abstract space and time. Edges, straight lines, geometric forms, as Gibson noted, do not actually exist for the brain. These are concepts of the classic metaphysic and the brain does not and cannot employ them, therefore. The brain is rather embedded within, intrinsically part of the indivisibly transforming field of the temporal metaphysic. For the brain, there can only be and only exist invariance over flows. And it is this invariance over flows that are the building blocks of the brain's world and the brain's specification of our external world. So the classic metaphysic is derived. It's, it's a derivative. It's derived from the brain working in, embedded in the universe of the temporal metaphysic. In other words, it's a conceptual construction. And as we'll see later down the road, at least per my plan, our very notion of computation, the fundamental concept underlying the computer model of the brain and the notion that the brain is indeed performing computations as we understand it currently in the computer model, this very notion is equally a derivative. Just to come back to color, we have seen in the previous quote from Bergson that the entire universal field has to be considered 
colored even at the null scale and we're deriving colors by placing scale collapsing so to speak this massive set of vibrations condensing it in what we perceive as a color but one of the difficulties in the color literature on color is an actual property of, of the matter field is that there's no particular features apparently that support color and so they because there's no particular features that we could map easily to color <clears throat> color is considered an illusion again just in the mind for example hue is not sufficient to specify a color reflectance is not sufficient to specify a color and light conditions can change the color specified enormously as well so there seems to be no particular color but the problem is there's no features that support form either as we as we have seen we can equally have a rotating rigid cube or a wobbly plastic knot cube and we'd have this, we could make exactly the same statement then no features support form yet there's a specification of form so we can simply talk about the specification of the coffee cups color in this case blue and going off an idea by or concept by Byrne and Hilbert in behavioral and brain sciences they spoke of color being specified in proportions of hue magnitudes for example the blue is um, 85 percent of the of the color is blue 10 percent yellow two percent red two percent green so what we have is an optimal specification of the field or an optical color specification of the field yes just just like the rotating cube or the wobbly cube or optical optical specifications now I'm not saying this isn't a total theory of color I'm just showing the road that one would travel down to explain color as a specification an optimal specification of properties of the field but as an optimal specification it is no longer an illusion it's no longer just in the mind so now we come to the great question how do we avoid the homunculus the little man the little viewer observing the scene the specified scene and we come to this principle that I've been threatening everyone that I will explain this koan like statement questions relating to subject and object to the distinction and their union must be put in terms of time rather than of space well back to the implication of the various properties of the holographic field let's reconsider the dynamic transformation of this holographic field is indivisible for each instant it interpenetrates the next as the notes of a melody creating an organic whole an organic series and where each note or instant reflects the entire preceding series of notes each note being the reflecting or the reflection of the past there is a deep implication in this If the state of each point or event in the field reflects the influences of the whole in fact the history of the whole in effect each point at the null scale of time or the infinitely smallest scale has an elementary awareness of the whole that is precisely because that point so to speak is influencing the whole and simultaneously is receiving influences from the whole forming a very elementary form of awareness Bergson called this pure perception it is as though stretched across the universal matter field is a vast vibrant web of awareness 
And so if you remember, in part one we noticed, noted that the problem is not describing how perception arises, but how it is limited, which we solve by noting that the brain is affected a reconstructive wave passing through this field of pure perception and specifying a limited form of this perception. So again, we have this vast, vibrant web of awareness defined across the universal field. It's a highly coherent web. The thread-like fibers of the web, so to speak, are taut a light flick with those fingers sends reverberations instantly through the hole. This web, quote unquote, with its basic elemental awareness and its fundamental primary memory as the web transforms indivisibly, organically, over time, carries the elementary attributes of mind. So yes, this is a form of panpsychism, a unique one. We do not need tiny, proto-conscious particles here. We do not need to consider or solve what is considered the hallmark problem of panpsychism, namely the aggregation problem. That is how the consciousness of each particle is somehow in some mysterious, inexplicable way aggregated together to form a larger consciousness such as that of humans or even chipmunks. It is a panpsychism never discussed by philosophy because Bergson was never understood. The panpsychists, have, on, on, the other, other, on the other hand, have never understood that panpsychism of itself is not a solution for the origin of the image of the external world. That is the hard problem. What you're going to need is Bergson's reconstructive wave passing through this panpsychic holographic field specifying an image. And that's nowhere in the standard panpsychic literature. But note, Ray, this web, this web of awareness spread throughout the universal field. This is the null scale of time. The null scale is the most infinitely, infinitely small scale of time. It's the scale of an instant of infinitely small extent. There's, there's still transition motion within this instant of mine I'm thinking about. It's not static, but it's extremely small. It's not the scale of buzzing flies, stirring spoons, or falling leaves. It's a different scale. The brain, whether a chipmunk or a human, as a reconstructive wave embedded in this field and passing through it, is specifying past portions of the change of this field at a particular scale of time, a buzzing fly or a heron-like fly. And remembering virtual action, all is coordinated with the organism's action capability. For the frog at his time scale, a slowly moving fly implies a fly easily flicked out of the air with his tongue. Our brain is establishing a ratio relative to the micro events of the matter field. In the fly's case, relative to the micro events making up the body of the fly his wing beats, his eternal processes, internal processes. processes. So let's take a gedanken or thought exercise for a moment. Conceive of our body and the fly side by side within this universal field at the null scale, that is at the infinitely small scale of time. We see there is no spatial differentiation between our body and the fly. Both of these objects, quote unquote, our body and the fly, are simply phases, transfer transferences of state in the global transformation of the holofield. But now allow our brain to gradually apply an increasing time scale in its specification. 
A ratio or proportionality is defined by the brain upon the field. An environment organism or E slash O ratio. So we can gradually raise this ratio. The fly will transition from an undifferentiated phase of the field where our body and the fly are in fact, not separate, but phases of the field, transfers of state within the global motion of the field. And at the null scale, our initial consideration, where with our little ratio over on the right of field events to neural events, uh, be virtually one to one field events to neural events. This is just an arbitrary ratio that I'm picking here. It would transition to an ensemble of quarks where we would receive the fly as an ensemble of quarks and the ratio increases from five to one to a perceived whirl of electrons. That is a ratio of 10 to one. A motionless form, our motionless, stable, stock still fly arbitrarily 50 to 1 now, to the heron-like fly barely flapping his wings, a ratio of, say, 100 to 1, to the buzzing bean of our normal scale, a ratio of, say, 200 to 1. In other words, subject is differentiating from object. The essential unity of the two within the matter field our body and the little fly is never broken. We arrive at Bergson's principle. Subject is differentiating from object, not in terms of space, but of time. So the dynamical state of the brain as a reconstructive wave is specific to a source or sources that is our little fly within the holographic field and simultaneously to a time scaled form of the elemental awareness defined throughout the universal field or equivalently to a time scaled subset of the pure perception defined throughout the field. We do not need the viewer because the specification is already to a form, a subset of awareness or pure perception. So a koan from the Zen master Basui goes, who is it that hears? We can let the koan become, who is it that sees? Who is it that sees? The basis of the experiential answer and his Zen enlightenment, after contemplating this koan for many years, is clear. There is no one that sees. What is being specified is a modified, perspective-based, action-relevant form of the elementary awareness defined throughout the holographic field and at a given scale of time. One more time, what is being specified is a modified, perspective-based, action-relevant form of the elementary awareness or pure perception defined throughout the holographic field and at a given scale of time. The homunculus is gone. Now, Jean Piaget, who was a great de child developmental theorist and one-time student of Bergson, noted that in our initial state, when we're born infants, there is no differentiation between child and world, no differentiation from mother, from any objects, all is part of the child self. All is one undifferentiated matrix of self. For Bergson, in this matrix of experience, the body is the invariant. Our identity settles on the body. We become an object among other objects, a source of force 
among other sources of force. In other words, we begin to feel the separateness from ourselves and the rest of the world. And we begin to need a koan for enlightenment. So this is Bergson, the great and unique panpsychist, the original externalist, the exponent of inactivism, the powerful direct realist, all unrecognized not only by Searle, but by most of the philosophic world. So next time, we'll be dealing with how does memory work? For experience is not occurring solely within the brain. It cannot be solely stored there. The brain is specific to an event outside it in the external world, the buzzing fly. The experience of the buzzing fly cannot be solely stored in the brain. Down the road, we'll be dealing with thought and cognition, AI and the singularity, pre explicit memory, free will voluntary action, implications of education, a bit on evolution, and because time is so important, Bergson versus Einstein and relativity. On remembering next time, till then, signing off.